Hello, I'm Father Greg Carlson, Jesuit priest and professor of theology and literature at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm standing here in the Mind's Eye Gallery of the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, which features a wonderful exhibit titled, I See That Fable Differently. This exhibit comes from a collection I've developed over 35 years that has some 9,000 unique fable books and probably about 5,000 objects presenting fables. Here in this gallery for the springtime months until late April of this year, 2018, the Jocelyn is showing 13 fables, each of which has at least two artworks where the artists are saying with their art, I see that fable differently. During this short video, I'd like to show you two of those fables in a little bit more depth, and I welcome you to this quick tour of I See That Fable Differently. For each of the 13 fables presented in this exhibit, the Jocelyn offers a wall panel of a text of the fable, what's the story, and it offers cards of comments. Those comments were prepared by students in a course I team taught with Professor Aaron Averett last semester, where students researched the works in this show and prepared a short comment for the benefit of people who would come to see the show. Their short text of this fable runs something like this. The wind and the sun were having a contest because the north wind, as always, was such a braggart. The sun finally confronted him and said, let's have a contest, and the wind agreed. They settled on this. Who could get the coat off of a traveler? The north wind blew first, and the stronger the north wind blew, the more the traveler just gathered his coat around him. Finally, the north wind gave up, but said to the sun, I couldn't do it. I'm sure you can't do it either. The sun simply began to smile and shine on the traveler, who first loosened his coat as he warmed up, and finally, as the sun continued to shine, the traveler took his coat off. Persuasion could do more than force. The sun, a little bit like Huck Finn getting people to paint the fence for him, got the traveler to take the coat off himself. The first of these two presentations of the story of the north wind and the sun is a lovely colored rendition by Roger Chapelain Midi done in the 1960s. It was a part of a wonderful grouping of 20 young French artists, each of whom chose one fable of La Fontaine to represent. Let's take a closer look at that rendition. For Chapelain Midi, the center of attention in this work, I think you'll agree, is the fierce black north wind with hair disheveled like a Medusa's set of snakes coming out of her hair. And this north wind is blowing fiercely on a little traveler traveling across a sandscape with a cloak around his neck. The wind is so fierce that it's churning up waves that knock over a tower in the midst of the water. In the meantime, the sun simply shines over in a blue sky, waiting for its turn to deal with the traveler and his coat. The second of the two works on the wind and the sun is done by Scott Rolfe, who works with left objects and creates assemblages or in this case, an assemblage with A-E at the beginning of the word assemblage. He works with materials he finds in junkyards or at uh, flea markets or garage sales and arranges them in lovely presentations, in this case of Aesop's Fables. The work was part of a book that Scott Rolfe did called Assemblages. And it's for this exhibit that I was able to get two of his objects for this collection. 
Let's see how he presents the story of the wind and the sun. Scott Rolfe, to create the wind, takes a bulb, has some kind of wire wound around it in three concentric circles, has lovely eyes looking fiercely down, and the blast of the wind is a very light sort of material. His focus, I think, is rather on the traveler and the traveler's arms as he gathers his coat more strongly around him, even in the midst of the blast of the wind. Here, the sun also has three concentric circles, has eyes as the north wind has eyes, and even has a little bit of a smile as he waits his turn, confident that he can win this contest. The fable of the grasshopper and ant is an important one for this exhibit for two reasons. First of all, the Jocelyn has a fine painting by Georges Viber presenting this very fable in their European, in their standard European collection. But secondly, La Fontaine chose this fable to be the very first in his first book of the 12 books of fables he wrote. He made changes that make this fable, I think, programmatic for him. Before La Fontaine, the fable was generally told something like this. The grasshopper played his way through summer, having a grand time singing, dancing, and asking the ants who were around to come and play with him. No, they said, we have to work to get ready for winter. Well, fall came and winter, and the grasshopper found himself freezing and without food. He came to the ants and said, you've got to give me some food, please. And they said, what did you do all summer? And he said, well, I sang. They shut the door in his face and said, well, then you can dance all winter, condemning him probably to die in the winter's snows. Jean de La Fontaine made this fable the first of his whole collection of some 200 fables in 12 books. And I think he did that because the fable is programmatic for him. First of all, he says of the ant, the ant is never a lender. That's the least of her flaws. She does not lend anything to anyone. And La Fontaine has his grasshopper come asking the ant not for a handout, but for a loan, which the grasshopper will repay with interest at the next harvest. But the biggest change La Fontaine makes is, I think, in the answer that the grasshopper makes to the ant's question, what were you doing all summer? La Fontaine's grasshopper says, I sang for the pleasure of anyone who came to listen. He's making the fable about himself and every other artist who deserves the support of the public that he is helping with his artistry. We'll watch now how several French artists use that interpretation of the fable and see that fable differently. As we consider the fable of the grasshopper and ant, we'll look first at two French broadsides, one from the 1890s, one from 1952. They were found at different times at one of my favorite places in the whole world, the Clignancourt flea market on the outskirts of Paris. We'll see that both of these French artists pick up on La Fontaine's particular accent in this fable, sympathetic to the poor grasshopper artist. This lovely broadside by an artist named Nellet, N-E-L-E-T, comes from the 1890s. It's a quite unified composition with the text in the lower left and a vine rising up and pointing to the picture that's at the center of this lovely piece. The artist is the scantily clad grasshopper with her stringed instrument lying in the snow. She's barefoot and has a tattered dress, but is a beautiful woman asking for help. The three ants stand in a rejecting position, 
warmly clad, each of them with head covering, the door is closed and it will remain closed to this starving artist. This beautiful representation from Paul Collin in 1952 has its own particular qualities. First of all, just brilliant colors. Secondly, though the, both these insects are human, they have kept some insect qualities. Consider, for example, the arm of the ant as it holds the fastener on this swinging window uh, pane that she's open to find out what the grasshopper is asking. She remains an ant-like insect. And the grasshopper, with the beautiful flow of her dress, has the characteristics of a grasshopper's wing. She is humble and despondent with her head down. The ant is in a rejecting position. It's not even a door anymore. It's only a window, and there is no chance that this grasshopper will get any help from this ant. The third version of the grasshopper and ant that we'll look at today is from the Jocelyn's own permanent collection. It was done by Georges Vibert in the late 1800s, and it takes a quite different view of this fable. As you can see, Vibert changes our approach to this fable in several important respects. First, we've moved from the city to the country. Secondly, we've moved from a woman ant with her children often in a house to a single male monk. Thirdly, we've added a second monk in the background with two animals, apparently horses, laden with spoil. And the monk himself has a dead bird on his back. What's happening here? This monk and his companion have either been out hunting and have plenty of food to spare, or they're collecting gifts from the faithful. In either case, they have plenty to eat and are refusing this begging artist. What Vibert has done is to make this fable, which in La Fontaine's version was about an artist needing help and offering to pay back, and made it into a strong anti-clerical statement. This monk's outfit has a rosary hanging from its cincture or belt right next to a knife. What he's doing is presenting religious rejection of a poor figure. The fact that it's out in the country has us thinking about Jesus' own story of the Good Samaritan, where a religious person, in fact two of them, met someone half dead on the road. They had horses, or he had horse that he could carry him on, it's a new kind of refusal, not just a refusal of the artist, but especially an anti-clerical refusal by religious people. It fits with many of Vibert's paintings, one of which is also in the Jocelyn, showing the uh, clerics of Rome bowing down to the two or three-year-old son of Napoleon who has been named King of Rome. In Vibert's artistry, the picture, the story, has taken on a whole new meaning. He sees that fable differently. The fourth of these works on the grasshopper and ant that we'll look at today was a real surprise to me. I found it on eBay, and it's a front page newspaper cartoon from the magazine or newspaper Judge in 1887. You can see right away that the artist Victor Gillum has taken Vibert's anti-clerical painting and made it into a political cartoon. It appeared on the front page of Judge Magazine on Christmas Eve in 1887. The ant now is the Democrat Grover Cleveland chastising the mugwump, who is the grasshopper, 
the Mugwumps changed party and favored Cleveland and helped him win the election in 1884. Now it's 1887 and they have not helped him enough. He has lost the election to the Republican Benjamin Harrison. Notice that this figure who had been a monk now has lost his rosary, that's changed into a normal rope. He lost his companion and their horses, so we've lost that strong reference to the Good Samaritan, and we've added a White House to make sure that it's clear that this is a political cartoon. Thank you for being with us today for this quick look at I See That Fable Differently.